Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk all things hockey are your hosts, Brad Crisco, Ryan Hanna, and Evan Lobsinger. Goes to show how badly the Red Wings need a right-handed defenseman. When uh, last episode and we when we were doing Will Smith's prospect profile, right-handed shooting centerman, we talked about him as a centerman, and obviously he's one of the top-ranked centers in the draft. We accidentally labeled him when you were introing him, Brad, uh, as a right-handed shooting defenseman, and it just sounded so natural that even in post and everything, we didn't catch it once. And I think actually uh, afterwards, Evan told us that he did hear it, but then forgot before he could tell us. <laughs> I was like, are we actually doing the prospect I thought we were doing? Did, did we? Because it was so fluid, no break. I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just making sure it was Will Smith. And it was Will Smith, right-handed shooting, shooting center. Sorry about It's that, almost folks. difficult to say when you're trying to say it correct because all we ever do is talk about right-handed defensemen. Yeah, our muscle, like our, our the muscle memory in our vocal cords just guides us towards those words. Yeah. All right, folks, welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast, here to talk to you about all things Detroit Red Wings hockey, uh, the world of the NHL, drama with regards to jerseys, international play, and lots, lots more. I am one of your hosts, Ryan Hanna. I'm Brad Crisco. And I'm Evan. On this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast, we'll be talking about the uh, the Red Wings' previous two games, one against Florida, one against St. Louis, uh, as well as where they are in the draft lottery standings, what they have upcoming. Uh, we'll be talking about the news of who is going to succeed Adidas as the uh, official uh, makers, rights holders, whatever you want to call it, of the uh, the NHL's official jerseys, and uh, the World Baseball Classic, and more importantly, how it relates to the world of hockey, international hockey, and what are we missing out on based on the drama that went down last night. We have a prospect profile for you today, as well as some other NHL news. Before we get into all of that, first... Winged Wheel Podcast Day at the LCA. This is your last chance to get tickets. DetroitRedWings.com slash WWP. They are going fast. At the time of recording, there are 17 left. That's it. There will be no more after that. We are going to be completely sold out. So if you want your tickets, get them ASAP. DetroitRedWings.com slash WWP. It's a discounted ticket to the April 8th Red Wings game against the Pittsburgh Penguins at the LCA. You sit with other Winged Wheel Podcast fans, listeners, uh, and the hosts. Uh, a portion of the proceeds from each ticket sold goes to benefit the Jamie Daniels Foundation. Plus, we have some other goodies in there that involve uh, your ticket purchase. After the game, so post-game this time around, because it is a 1 p.m. game, we're going to be doing a live recording of the Winged Wheel podcast in the Budweiser Beer Garden right outside Little Caesars Arena. Special guest Ken Daniels will be there, uh, as well as others. So uh, be sure to keep an eye out on your email, wingedwheelpodcast.com slash blog as well for more information on that front, but DetroitRedWings.com slash WWP to get your ticket. Speaking of the, speaking of the Jamie Daniels Foundation, uh, Comedy Night of Hope is happening Thursday, April 13th. So if you miss out on your ticket and or you want to support the Jamie Daniels Foundation in another way, Comedy Night of Hope uh, is a great, great event that they run. Uh, it's a good time, lots of laughs, and it'll be... Um, shortly after Winged Wheel Podcast Day at the LCA. So Thursday, April 13th at 6.15 p.m. The link will be in the description, but you can get your tickets at jamiedanielsfoundation.org. Okay, so the Red Wings went 1-1 one one in the uh, two games since we last spoke. The first one against Florida was a uh, home game, a 5-2 loss, where not much of note, very much the feeling of this is getting towards the end of the season. And... Uh, Really, the biggest story there was Simon Edvinson and how much bigger he is than Matthew Kachuk. He had that one play where he uh, was defending uh, against Kachuk, who was going around behind the net. Uh, Kachuk went to the ice. Edvinson knocked him down. It was really good defense. And then Kachuk was doing the thing where he was laying on Edvinson's stick, etc. After the play, he um, he skated over to Edvinson and had some words for him. And him looking up at Edvinson to chirp was like Brad looking up at you, Evan, trying to chirp him. It was actually really funny to see. Aside from uh, Edvinson looking down at the puny man that was Matthew Kachuk, any other takeaways from his game uh, in his uh, second outing with Detroit? The um, the one that stood out to me, which probably stood out to a lot of people, was the one play he had on uh, the Florida blue line, keeping the puck in. He poke checked somebody, kicked the puck up to a stick, and immediately found Pew Suter out front of the net, who couldn't bury it, but... Um, that kind of play from a guy who's played three NHL games 
is impressive. That is a very – because if he missed that poke check, not only is the guy blowing by him, but I think it was probably a three-on-one the other way. So the fact that he had the confidence to do that and, and make a play out of it was was a huge sign. Yeah, I'm not sure who it was out front, but he had a few of those plays. I, I mentioned last episode that his stick has been very active, and especially at either blue line, he's been – uh, playing with some confidence. Again, he, he hasn't done too much. That was his second game in the NHL, so he hasn't been doing too much that's been flashy, but small moments like that, like kicking the puck up to your stick. Uh, he had one in his first game where it was stopping the puck at his own blue line, and then the play turned around and he fired it up the ice. It was He's done well to, to know when to activate and not be, you know, at the very least not be a liability, with mm-hmm. which like 14 to 15 minutes over your first couple of games – it's all you can expect from from Simon Edmondson, and I think he did it well. We talked about it last episode. He just had to come in there and bring it home, and that's what he did. Uh, a big, actually, takeaway from that game was his uh, moment where he jumped up into the play really well, showed off his skating, and danced around Radko Gudas. And if not for Gudas getting the, the hip check slash... I don't know. I, at first, I thought it was a hip check, and then slow-mo, it looks like his hip slash elbow kind of caught... Simon Edvinson's like upper thigh, which I think is just a function of Edvinson being a, a redwood tree more than anything else. So I'm not sure how much you can fault Gudis for that, but uh, danced around him almost perfectly and would have been a fantastic play, but ended up, you know, going end over end just because of that, that hit. And I think he's uh, a little banged up because of that. I wouldn't be surprised if he has a contusion or something on his leg, but you know, he, he was, it was a continuation from his first game. His second game was really good. And, I think he uh, he demonstrated his ability to activate, use his stick in a really smart way. Um, and it wasn't just defensive plays this time like it was on uh, Kachuk. Like you mentioned, Evan, the, the play at the blue line. So uh, all promising stuff for Simon Edvinson. I can't wait till a moment next season where Rasmussen, uh, Edvinson, Soderblom, and Sider are all on the ice at the same time with Jonathan Bergren. <laughs> just for some perspective. It will be so jarring to see in person. I still remember the first time I saw Soderblom on the ice in person. I was sitting in the lower bowl, and I was like, ah, I feel like he could reach up and touch the Jumbotron right now. <laughs> that guy's massive. Yeah, so those three. And you know what? We've talked for a long time about, you know, the Eiserman wants to build a big blue line and the advantage of having big but not, you know, lumbering guys who can play your blue line, be mean, and, and play a skilled game at the same time. But just seeing it out on the ice, you can see the impact of having Cider and Edvinson and other big guys in that. Like, it's going to be an imposing blue line to play against. Yeah, they're going to eat up a lot of room. And they're going to make those zone entries much more difficult, just like Edvinson showed. Like, when you have that kind of reach and that kind of length, it makes it really difficult. Your space evaporates instantaneously. Yeah. Anyways, Red Wings lost the game 5-2. Yeah, yeah that's great. <laughs> They're, uh, They're I believe, still the Red Wings, after all. That's yep, that is very much not on autopilot for the rest of the season, but trending in that direction. Uh, it was Puce Suter. I called him Puce the Truth Suter because I absolutely love how he has been the late season hero who has emerged as the rest of the team got sold off slash is nursing injuries slash is just exhausted. I meant Alex Chase on Believer. Oh man, from the time you started that sentence to now, he has three more power play goals in front of the net. Talk about efficiency. <laughs> the man has a job and he does it well. Uh, Suter scored in front of the net after a great play from uh, David Perron. And then uh, Larkin had a really nice goal wherein he demonstrated something that isn't often talked about. And Mickey Redmond on the Valley Sports Detroit broadcast uh, had a nice feature on it where uh, he talked about Larkin hiding. Basically, you know, floating away from the play where defenders expecting uh, expect him to be and calling for the puck in a way that didn't sell where he was to both the defenders and the goalie, so he didn't give the goalie any opportunity or indication to cheat. Uh, got the puck on his stick and fired it home from a, a tight angle like we've seen him do before. I mentioned that he watched Matthew's tape, I believe, to do that, but uh, really kind of a, a nice demonstration of hockey smarts from Larkin on that one. Yeah, to uh, be a number one center, you need to be smart. Hockey IQ is the most important trait, so, you know, just add that one in the is Dylan Larkin a number one center debate? Yeah, well, <laughs> you know what? Anyone's still having that debate. Fine by me. Do what you want. But the, the contract has been signed. It is what it is. <laughs> if we're having that debate still into the future, there's something going wrong. It isn't. The debate now isn't, is Dylan Larkin a number one center? He very much is. Uh, the debate has now turned to, 
you need two number one centers to win a Stanley Cup. Yeah. And who is the second one going to be? Yeah. So that was the Red Wings against Florida. They lost, which, you know, bad. You lost. But it was good for two reasons. One, uh, gave Florida an important win in their chase uh, of the New York Islanders, where the Red Wings have a vested interest because they own their 2023 first-round pick conditionally. Um, and so the lower the Islanders are, the better that pick is, or it gets pushed to next season, which could also be a really good situation. And two, because it kept them at 69 points through 69 games. Nice. Uh, anyhow, speaking of the uh, important games in terms of where the Red Wings are going to draft, their next game was against the St. Louis Blues, who are right next to them in the overall NHL standings. And the first period was somewhat interesting. Alex Chason, as as Evan alluded to, got a power play goal in front. Uh, you could literally launch a puck from a missile, a missile launcher, and Alex Chason would cradle that puck into the net. He's such he's the best backboard in the NHL. The Dano Chara slap shot right onto a stick, it go back into the net into the back of the net. Like 100%. it's just outrageous. Whenever people are like, we have to sign him, we have to sign him, we have to sign him. I, I think ah. Uh, I could see a world where the Red Wings sign him because it's all going to depend on roster spots and things. But if he keeps doing this, you can't really. <laughs> you kind of have to say, like, bring this guy in just for that power play net front. Like, he's converted on so many opportunities. How many failed experiments have the Red Wings tried at power play net front? I feel like that's one of the never-ending conversations in the history of this podcast is, oh, it's going to be Bertuzzi. Oh, it's going to be Rasmussen. Oh, it's going to be Soderblom. Oh, it's going to be Sundqvist. Oh, it's going to be pick the thousand other names that have been tried Just there. Just an applicator. And none of them thrived in that role. So it's a very, very small sample size. But hey, maybe. First four goals of the team, all in the power play. He's building a, he's building a case. Uh, Perron was the one who set that play up, and that was a really nice. I know, <laughs> Evan. I know you. Hey, get... he played there for what, like ten years? I think that's warranted. Okay, so the 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 David Perron video tribute passes the Evan smell yep. test. So yep. that was a nice moment. They love him there. He was buzzing last night too. Oh yeah, you could tell it meant a lot to him. Uh, not the same thing, but you just felt like I, I honestly would. I I might have bet if someone asked me to that Jacob Verano was going to score that game. The way he was shooting the puck and, and you know, circling the offensive zone, I was like, ooh, you feel that he's hungry for it. I, I, I'm i suspecting that one's going to get through it because that's just the way things go in hockey. I'm kind of surprised that it didn't in the end. I'm glad it didn't. Yeah, well, yeah, great for the Red Wings. Alex Chase on score to tie it up. Uh, St. Louis took the lead, and then Philip Zadina got a puck on his stick where the goalie was wildly out of position. Everyone else was out of position. The puck kind of deflected. Right on to uh, where Zadina needed it, and he scored. Fired it home. Doesn't matter. It happened. It happened. It went in. We'll take it. First goal in 13 games. First lucky bounce of his career. It might be. It might and, be. And didn't double clutch it. Just fired it as he needed it to. That was I'm Great. gonna I'm gonna say something, but I'm so happy I can finally say this with a stat behind it. He had a good game. He had a noticeably good game after being invisible for a while. So it was good to see him play well and score a goal because they so rarely happen together. <laughs> after the first period, I kid you not, nothing happened. Nothing happened to the point where you would almost think that these players didn't want to score. They were trying, but the attempts were so bad. And the ho- like it was one of the least eventful 45 minutes of hockey for the second, third period and overtime. Like, terrible. And even through the first, what was it, seven shooters, all of them, nobody scored. I found it somewhat ironic that Verona tried to do the Datsuk against Detroit. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Valeno tried it earlier in the game as well. No, Valeno tried oh, the Oh, no, Forsberg. he didn't try the Datsuk. He tried the Forsberg. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He or came... the Zetterberg around here. Yeah, that's right. He came close, kind of. He had he had it. He just missed the puck. He had the goalie on the fake. He had the move executed perfectly. He just set the puck an inch out of his reach. Needed to, yeah, just needed to, I think he needed to do it a little bit quicker. He yeah, ran out of space. The momentum of... Pulling it from forehand to one hand, he just had a little too much on it. And I messaged in the group chat, and I'll say it here. You ever have those dreams where you're 
trying to punch someone and you're like you just have the softest punches in the world, like pillow punches. No. Evan's like, no, I'm I'm rocky in yeah. my dreams. Yeah. Evan's like, I beat the hell out of everyone in my dreams. I win all my shower arguments. What are you all, talking about? All those all those hypothetical questions about how many twelve year olds could you take out before you got tired. Evan's like, oh, it's until the dream ends. <laughs> yeah, it's like World War Z, where the small <laughs> children are going over the wall, and they're just they're on my back, and I'm throwing them Evan's thirty just feet in the air. King Kong yeah. at the yeah. top of the wall. Yeah, that is, oh. Anyway, sorry. What? <laughs> just make sure uh, Mel and Crystal don't listen to this episode, so we can still leave our kids to be babysat by him someday you think you're, you're taking that risk that? oh yeah that's fine <laughs> your kids are gonna come back counting cards and <laughs> that's amazing that, yeah Ro- actually, rolling c- uh, cigars or something i don't know turn into a little profit center you're just volunteering as babysitter you need to i'm not volunteering uh again the the point i was trying to make is that was the scoring attempts in this game lucas raymond scored on the eighth shot in the shootout to end it in it was great. The Red Wings won. Awesome. But it was honestly a mercy. It was like that was almost painful to watch by the end. Uh, Magnus Helberg, you know, it wasn't a lot of shots on goal, but he had a, a couple of key saves too. Regardless, that's that's the Red Wings. They got One a, of them on Jacob Verona. Yep. A few. Like Verona, again, Verona had quite a few um, scoring attempts. Uh, how many shots on goal did they credit? Five shots on goal. I, wow. wonder who, I wonder who was shooting to score that game. So that was a 2-1 shootout win. So if you are Team Tank, maybe not the best result in your mind, but uh, it's a shootout win, so they still gave St. Louis a point, and Detroit still has an opportunity here with with St. Louis and Vancouver trailing them. Uh, You know, they could still end up as low as 25th, I think, in the league. Like Columbus, San Jose, Chicago, Anaheim, Montreal, Philadelphia, Arizona, Vancouver, St. Louis, Detroit. Detroit's 10th. In, in terms of lottery standings right now, but I could honestly see a world where St. Louis and Vancouver uh, pass them. Like Detroit goes up to uh, as high as eighth. Imagine before this season saying, hey, with 10 games left, Arizona is only going to be six points back. Wow, great. Arizona must be having a great season yeah. you by know, their standards. If it wasn't for Vimelka, I honestly think that they would be way closer in the Connor Bedard lottery. That guy has been unreal. Credit to... Um, uh, the, the coaching staff out in, yeah, yeah. Turnier, out in Arizona. The, he's really got a ragtag bunch of LTIR contracts playing <laughs> playing some fantastic hockey and honestly not ideal conditions in terms of arena and amenities. I know the atmosphere on the ice is good, but in terms of the amenities they have, it's not as, as great as some other NHL teams. He He deserves a lot of credit for what he's done over there. He's making a good name for himself. Upcoming, the Red Wings have uh, another game against St. Louis. So again, in the world of the uh, draft standings, uh, the draft order and the draft lottery, that is going to be very, very important against St. Louis. That's at home at the LCA on Thursday, 7 Eastern. And Saturday, matinee against Philadelphia on the road, 1 p.m. So those are the Red Wings' uh, next two upcoming games, and we'll be back with you on Sunday. I just realized a very neat fact while I was looking at the standings on your computer there. Hmm. So the Red Wings are trailed immediately by St. Louis and Vancouver, correct? Mm-hmm. So that means as of right now in the second round, the Detroit Red Wings have three consecutive picks because they have Vancouver's and St. Louis's second rounders. Oh, that's great. That's really neat. We could pick a forward defenseman and a goalie. Let's solve three problems. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so three left defensemen in a row then. <laughs> yes. As is tradition. Okay. That's the Red Wings. Uh, why don't we talk a little bit about the draft and the actually no very quickly here because we get the question a lot. You know we don't talk about the the draft lottery order really uh, trying to maximize the picks like the pick percentage for Connor Bedard. Like the Red Wings currently have a three and a half percent chance at Connor Bedard. It goes up to five percent if they swap spots with St. Louis and six percent if they swap spots with Vancouver. So best bang for a buck is one slot. No, simple as. Why not just go there? Why not? Yeah. So it, it's not like they wouldn't even be doubling. They wouldn't go from three, three and a half to seven. It would be 6% if St. Louis and Vancouver both passed them. Yeah. I. It's more about the oh draft my God. spot. It's more about the draft position and just make sure you're getting your guy. If they really value, let's say, a center there's the risk that if if Vancouver and St. Louis don't pass them that you know hypothetical situation 
Vancouver takes Oliver Moore, St. Louis takes Braden Yeager. All of a sudden, the Red Wings had you know this group of centers that they were hoping to pick from that just isn't there anymore. Every spot you jump in the draft, you get a little more control over what player you're getting. So for me, it's if you're on Team Tank, it's less about the Bedard odds. It's about let's be sure we can get our guy. And in a draft where there is uh, not only a lot of high end players, like you're talking, yeah, Bedard, uh, Fantilli, Michkov, but you're you know Carlson, Will Smith. What well, depends on what you think of Oliver Moore. Like, there's a lot of guys out there, and then the Michkov thing complicates that order too. You don't know how teams are going to prioritize guys. The Russian factor is still a very, very big thing. Outside of the fact that he has a locked-in contract for the next however many years, three years, you want to be as high up as possible because someone it's very likely that someone very, very good is going to slip. So you want to be there to catch them, essentially. Um, so every time we talked about talk about the Bedard lottery standings, it's really more about just making sure Detroit's first pick is as good as possible. Okay, why don't we talk about the draft and we'll head over to our uh, draft prospect profile for this episode, which is none other than Braden Yeager out of Moose Jaw in the WHL, a right-handed shooting center. Or, yeah, so center. Much could, like Will Smith. Yeah, could be a winger, but definitely not a defenseman. Right-handed shooting center, Braden Yeager out of Moose Jaw. Personally, I think this is a very risky Option just because we've seen Steve Eiserman's history of drafting forwards named Braden out of Moose Jaw. <laughs> you are very happy with yourself on that one. It's been six months in the making. Can you give the folks who are maybe not getting it an explanation? Braden Point yep. was drafted out of Moose Jaw by yep. Steve Eiserman. Anyways, uh, jokes aside, Braden Yeager is, uh, again, a player the Red Wings should look long and hard at drafting because he fills a lot of needs. A lot of projections, if you look at the rankings, have him in the range the Red Wings should be picking. So this is, unlike Will Smith, a very strong possibility. We talked about how Colby Barlow fit a lot lot of the Red Wings' needs. We talked about Zach Benson, how he fits a lot of the Red Wings' needs. Braden Yeager also checks a lot of those boxes. He's a center, shoots right, highly competitive, absolutely top end finisher with an elite shot. Does any of that sound like something the Red Wings desperately need? Now he may not have the upside of a Braden point, but he would very much fill the Braden point role per se. He's not a poor skater, but he's not, you know, a burner who's that's going to be his calling card in the NHL, not an elite puck handler, like a Trevor Zegras, but good enough hands to execute what he wants to do on the ice. Um, it's his shot, his intelligence, and his compete that are going to make it happen at the next level. Uh, he's got an elite release. He's got a hard shot. He's got the ability to get into the home plate area to make it happen. He's got good enough playmaking and good enough smarts to maneuver the offensive zone to make plays, other plays happen if the shot isn't there. And despite being a fairly small forward, you know, circling back to the compete, He's not afraid to get in the dirty areas. He wins a lot of battles. He he will get to the center of the ice. He's he's not afraid of contact and he'll go to the net if it's there. So the only question, you know, that I have with Braden Yeager, why he's not my slam dunk pick for the Red Wings is just how high is that talent at the NHL level? There's nothing about Braden Yeager's profile not to like. Mm-hmm. And, and we've talked about this with other players like Barlow and whatever. It's just how good is his good? Is it Second line center in the NHL? Is it second line winger? Is it third line center? All of those are very much in play. And depending where you fall on that prediction of what he is would depend. Are the Red Wings picking him at 10? Or are they picking him at 20 with the Islanders pick? Because he's probably not getting to 20, so do you take that risk? Who else is available? Do you think Oliver Moore's ceiling is higher? Do you think Colby Barlow's ceiling is higher? Because that's all it comes down to. Honestly, for me as Jaeger, because the the profile of the player, I love it. You know, does this fit the Steve Eisenman criteria? 10 out of 10, no questions asked. Yeah, his his positive attributes, as you just really outlined really well, Brad, are exactly why I'm interested. Like he's on the list of players who I am very, very keen on for the Red Wings to take a look at. The ultimate talent ceiling 
and the positionality are the two things that get me with, ooh, I don't know if this is the right pick for Detroit's first pick, wherever that ends up. Now, they can go win every game for the rest of the season, and their first pick could be pick 14 or something stupid like that. But as of right now, Braden Yeager is, in my mind, a little bit closer to the Islanders pick, if that makes sense. Uh, really, that that's variable as to where that's going to end up. If they make the playoffs, they make a run because Sorokin is you know a god amongst men, then we're not even having that conversation here. Yeah, even if you think he's going to be a winger more likely than than a center, and even if you think he's going to be uh, a guy whose shot is going to be more threatening on the power play and maybe going to be you know a second line level talent, I don't mind that at all with pick fifteen to twenty five. I think that's something that would make a lot of sense for the Red Wings to target. I'm not completely certain whether or not he'll project as a center. I don't think the odds are stacked in his favor to stay as a center, uh, but that kind of thing is completely. It's very variable, and, and I don't think the NHL is too good at knowing for certain who's going to land at a center quite yet. Uh, he's very much going to be influenced on who's left around him. Where are you picking? Is it closer to the you know pick eight than maybe not in my mind? Are you looking at Braden Yeager? But otherwise, he's going to be he's going to make a team in like you know anywhere past ten. I think really really happy. Which could be the Red Wings. Yeah, could for two picks it could be the Red Wings. Yeah, so. There's definitely a, a bit of a log jam in that like seven to twelve ish spot of this draft, where it's like it almost feels like apples to apples. It really just depends, you know, how the the interviews go, what your deep analysis of those those players are, and um, it's going to be a tough job for the scouting staff of all teams this year to really hammer down who they think is their guy at the at that spot in the draft. And it's also tough, right? Like you don't draft someone right now for a hole you have in your lineup right now. Like if you draft a really, really talented goal scorer because the Red Wings couldn't score for shit this year, it's not inherently a bad move, but they are also going to not be able to score for shit next year. Like, Unless you're taking someone at the very, very top of the draft, there needs to be some buffer time for them to develop. We on the show preach patience with prospects a lot. So... You know, you. I also want to be careful when I'm evaluating prospects, and especially someone like Jaeger. Am I getting too wrapped up in how beautiful his his wrist shot is? For example, he's that's not going to be a solution for Detroit over the next three years, most likely. At least not in a, a way that's going to make a material difference in the standings, even if he makes it towards the tail end of those three years. So it's another thing to consider here. I, I obviously, for for example, that right-handed defenseman conversation that we have quite a bit. They need that. And we know they need that not just on their roster now, but their pipeline is also very, very thin. Well, that's the point, because you're right. You shouldn't compare it to the team, but you should compare it to the prospect pipeline. And exactly. Yeah. If you look at Braden Yeager and you go, a right-handed shooter that can absolutely do a lot of things nobody on the current roster can, i.e. shoot the puck at an elite level, yeah, that's fairly irrelevant because God knows what this roster looks like in three years. So you got to look at the pipeline. Do the Red Wings have any, uh, they may not have any elite shooters or scorers on the team, but do they have any in the pipeline? The answer is also no. So <laughs> At some point, you need to get one. You need to get one. Carter Mazur is a very effective scorer, but in a completely different way from a Braden Yeager. Marco Casper is an effective scorer, but in a very different way than Braden Yeager. And honestly, beyond those two, I don't know if they have any truly effective scorers that are strong candidates to make the Red Wings. Buchelnikov is a little more like that in terms of the elite shot, but he's more of a long shot yeah. to be a regular NHLer. And <laughs> even beyond him, Matt, I know I'm probably forgetting someone, but it is so thin at forward in this pipeline right now. For Yeah, and like those are goal scores, goal scores that you were just talking about. Or at least Ye- like Jaeger and maybe but definitely Buchelnikov in comparison. Like, when, where Mazer or how Mazer was drafted, it wasn't as someone whose best attribute was his release. And, you know, same with Casper. It's great that they are finding ways to put the puck in the net at really good rates in their respective development paths. But to set yourself up for success, you want someone whose talent is to fire that puck home. We've referenced the term easy goals before. Someone who can just get easy goals. Like they get the puck in an area and the home plate in the offensive zone and just in half a second it's in the back of the net. They can just take that shot. They can make that play, that 
quote unquote easy goal. The Red Wings don't have one on the team. They don't have one in the system. Yeah, we used to talk about that with Mantha where he could do that and it was frustrating when he didn't. And you were hoping his development would take him to the point where he did that consistently. And then we talked about that with Verona, who did do it whenever he was playing and healthy for the Red Wings, which. Yeah, Verona Verona was the best reference we've had recently because you knew if he got that puck in that area in the offensive zone, it didn't matter where the circumstance or whatever was happening, it could go in the net. Yeah. There was a very strong possibility that puck was just coming off his stick into the net. They, the Red Wings, do not have it. That one timer threat on the power play. They don't have that. That guy who can kind of do the waterfall off his strong side, and you know that just getting into that position and releasing it's a strong possibility to score. They don't have that. Jaeger is that. Casper's not that. Mazer's not that. So that's an option. The Red Wings are going to have maybe two picks in the range of Braden Jaeger, optimistically, but it could happen. I don't think he's getting to the Islanders pick, realistically. And he's he's... His shooting talent is going to make a lot of teams look, especially as you get into that next tier of prospects. So keep your eye out for Braden Yeager. And I'm sure he's going to be a prospect probably that we're going to revisit too as we have a better idea of where the Red Wings' two picks are. Potentially two picks. Okay. Let's jump to some happy news. Fanatics. I don't know why we fooled ourselves into thinking it would be anyone but Fanatics. I think we said before, like, we're talking about this as if CCM is going to do it or bat. Like, it's going to be Fanatics no matter what. But the NHL announced that their jersey partner after their expiring deal with Adidas concludes at the end of the 2023-2024 season. Uh, they, they secured a new deal with a new partner because Adidas wanted to step away from doing hockey jerseys. None other than Fanatics. Fanatics has already been doing apparel uh, as well as uh, the breakaway jersey series, like the, I don't know, what do you want? Not knockoff, but just cheaper version. Yeah, to put it gently, uh, of NHL jerseys and and all apparel. They also had a pretty lucrative uh, setup where they could, um, you know, use any design that was uh, created by Adidas for jerseys and, and convert it into apparel. Uh, they've been doing that. I think they've been with the NHL in some capacity for a couple of decades, but really in earnest over like the last 10 ish years, uh, they've been doing NHL apparel. They are everywhere in the world of sports. They are becoming like the Amazon of everything to do with sporting apparel and goods. I think they're opening up a sports book because who isn't? Uh, and they don't have a good reputation. Let's call it what it is. Fanatics has sucked. I'm sorry. You guys know me. I, I, try to place things neutrally on this podcast at least when we're introducing a discussion and you know try to see every side of an argument or whatever it might be fanatics has had a shitty reputation with consumers fans especially hockey fans and for good reason terrible customer service worst product quality the only reason this is happening and it's a 10-year deal a 10-year you don't give 10-year deals to anybody Unless they give Unless you're you... Sergei Bobrovsky. <laughs> and what did what did they give Sergei Bobrovsky? A bajillion dollars. Yeah. And that's what Fanatics is giving the NHL. A bajillion dollars. The, the financial terms haven't been disclosed, but with the way the NHL has been running and with them recouping lost profits from COVID and with them desperately trying to keep up with the other major North American sports, this is a money move. And I got to say, it is one of the most anti- consumer anti-fan moves they've made full stop in a long long time and i am including jersey ads and and moving board ads and all that crap in there yeah but no one no one is affected by the ads gary bettman told us that's that. right he did in yeah. fact no they one's like bothered. It. yeah we like it ryan <laughs> i don't know about you but i like the ads that move and distract me from the hockey game it's great yeah it keeps you awake but on a more pleasant note our friends in australia will now get their nhl logos on the correct way <laughs> So happy for them. And there is a big contingent of Red Wings fans in Australia. So congratulations on your accidentally correct jerseys. I know I'm teeing off on them, but I, I'm just, I'm at a loss here as to, you know, how to, you can't sugarcoat this. Like there's going to have to be some massive changes in the way Fanatics has operated for the last X number of years for them to have any trust with, with NHL You know fans. how impossible it is for mega corporations to ch- pivot from their identity? And they don't want to. This has made them. This has made them money hand over fist. Why would they change? No. I'll, I'll try to be balanced here before I shit on them, and, and rest assured, I'm going to shit on them. But 
I want people to be accurate in knowing how they are going to be bad because I've seen a lot of things on Twitter that just aren't going to happen. Fanatics has never produced a high quality hockey jersey. So if you're looking at Fanatics jerseys right now going, oh, these are ass. Yes, they are. They're meant to be. They are. They are. At least in my store, they're almost half the price of the Adidas jerseys. They're the AliExpress. Yeah, the, they've got the shitty ironed on silver numbers. Like they look bad, but again, they're half the price. The jerseys Fanatics are going to be making for the NHL are not those. So let let before anybody gets worried about that, that's not the case. Fanatics for the first few years is going to be using the same factory in Quebec that Adidas is using to make the jerseys now. So they're going to be very Adidas like, at least for the first while. So it's not like these jerseys are going to come out and they're going to rip and they're going to have ironed on logos. That's not going to be the issue. Um, I, I, th- I forget if it's NFL or MLB, but Nike has the license, but it's actually been Fanatics producing the, MLB, the yeah. yeah producing the jerseys um, for the MLB. And there hasn't been any huge complaints in terms of jersey quality that the players are wearing and that the authentic jerseys of the fans are buying. So if you're worried about that, that's not going to be the issue. Fanatics is a big enough company that you go, hey, Adidas, what are the materials? How are you doing this? All right, we're going to do that. I have no concerns there. The problem with Fanatics is going to be the problem with Amazon. Once you get a company that's so big, you can't keep track of everything that's going on. There are going to be jerseys with player names spelled wrong. There are going to be orders that get lost. There are going to be... On their cheaper product, oh, yeah, it's going to be bad. It's going to be real bad AliExpress-type garbage. You can have your authentic jerseys that they'll probably charge $375 for, and they'll be fine. But everything else is going to be a nightmare. Your customer service experience is going to be bad. The prices are going to be bad. The quality for those prices is going to be bad. There's going to be a lot of mistakes. There's going to be a lot of headaches. It's terrible. When you get a bigger company doing more things, does it ever go better? (laughs) There's something to say like, yeah, they have this big contract. They're going to scale up because they're going to earn more money now. And we're not here to talk about the (laughs) – yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Yeah, continue. I do like when I can make Evan and Brad laugh. (laughs) We're not here to talk about the minutia of business. It's like it's – this is a reputation that has been earned, has been earned for a long time. And as companies get a monopoly, we the it only improves oh, the yeah, experience, yeah, right? Geez. And everything from like, oh, you you don't buy jerseys, you just buy t-shirts. Yeah, great. Enjoy, you know, your t-shirt that got ruined after three washes. Your jersey that never came, uh refunded like nine months later. Your it, Dylan Larkin jersey spelt with a B. Listen, you only make those purchases once because it's a mistake you only make once. The the part that got me You know, in this whole uh, pretty much, you know, ad pitch as they launched it, they talked to the breakaway jerseys have those stupid, practically like screen printed logos, which, again, if you don't care, that's fine. It's it's totally fine. My issue is the price. You get what you pay for. I still think they charge too much. Oh, they. Yes. My issue is like, oh, uh, it solves a problem of not being able to fold crests. Nobody was that wasn't an who's issue. doing that? nobody. It's it's just them making an excuse for putting out uh, a cheap overpriced terrible product for those who are listening and saying oh my god you know why does it matter the fan experience like it's what hockey is all about at the end of the day it's what hockey is all about and if you're not interested and you're never going to spend your money on it that's great you're i promise you you're already ahead but the fans who like to have apparel represent their team who are spending a lot of hard-earned money on these products they already cost too much Adidas, I think, was already charging too much. Reebok, in my mind, was already charging too much. And there were quality issues. Pick whatever manufacturer. You're hard-pressed to find one that was really, really objectively good. But this one is like the most, we chose Evil Corp because they gave us the most money decision that has happened. And it's just so in line with the way the entire like world is moving right now. Like it, especially coming out of COVID, every major corporation has just turned into recouping profits and, and recouping revenue and and turning into a profit center. The corporatization of the NHL has already happened, so it's not like a new phenomenon, but it's only going to go into over, overdrive now. But unless Fanatics sincerely changes and steps up their game 
and becomes at, gets at least to the sufficient standard of what Adidas offered, which, let me make clear, was a low bar. This is going to hurt their reputation with the fans for the next 10 years, and that, to me, is a short-sighted business move. I will happily eat crow if they turn into a fantastic uh, producer of apparel, jerseys, everything to do. They're going to be involved in jersey design and, and logo and, and team rebrands as well. Like They are very much integrated in that process. If they turn it around and they knock it out of the park on the, all those fronts, all the power to them. I'll say I was wrong. I'll say they, they beat my expectations. Congrats, Gary Bettman, NHL. You did it. But as of right now, this seems like a short-sighted move to maximize the dollars coming in for the partnership without much care as to the impact it's going to have on the fans with the teams and the fans with the NHL. Ryan, I'm going to talk about two separate things here. So I'm going to start with that point that you just made. When has the NHL given a shit what the fans want? We want, even if they want a play-in series, fans want a play-in series because it's more entertaining, Gary Bettman's shot it down. Fans want a one-to-eight playoff series, Gary Bettman has shot it down. Play-in series is coming. You know what it is. No, it's not. I, I would fans want it. It's not going to happen. Hundred dollar bet right now. Within five years, we'll have playing series. It's uh, Wednesday, March twenty second, twenty twenty three. How old is Gary Bettman? Gary Bettman's seventy. But regardless, if he retires before the five years, I'll pay you out the hundred dollars. I don't know if I'm still taking it, but I. My God, this guy's he's allergic to money. He is. I just bought a house, man, and I have two kids. <laughs> yeah, you are allergic You're, to money. <laughs> I literally am. for your wallet. You think I'm allergic because the money goes into my wallet and then it's immediately gone. Anyhow. I think the play-in series is coming, but continue your point. But yeah, the NHL so obviously and repeatedly proves they do not give a shit what the fans want. They are the worst league for that. <laughs> the MLB has been going through some stuff. They've yeah, put in the pitch the clock s- to speed the game up. They're trying stuff at least. I will... It, that, those leagues can care less about what the fans think. Because they make so much money. Yeah. Because there's no stopping them. The NHL is not the NFL or the MLB. They have to scratch and claw to keep up with MLS at this point. They need to do everything in their power to be consumer friendly. And that's on ice product, in arena product, and merchandise. Like the whole gambit. Even what we're not going back to the streaming argument or conversation. That as well. It's the whole package needs to be more consumer friendly. But that's. Evan, and that's why it'll nailed, never happen. <laughs> no, and that's why Evan nailed my point there. It's every avenue you look at the NHL, they do what is not what we want. The streaming is a nightmare. The jersey ads, nobody wanted. The playing series, best on best tournaments. There's the there's your segue, Ryan. Yeah, whatever you want. The NHL doesn't do it. So the fanatics thing, of course, this was going to happen. You even led it with your intro. You could see it coming a mile away. You knew it was going to happen, and you knew everybody was going to hate it. They posted the announcement at 6 a.m. on a Tuesday because they knew the backlash was going to be so severe. It's it's crazy. And then from uh, your – bless your optimistic heart, Ryan, of the, hey, maybe they get better. From a business perspective, when was the last time a giant company like Fanatics in any section of the market got a monopoly on something and the quality improved? The prices didn't go up. When when has that ever happened? You know that everything's getting more expensive and shittier quality. You can, but I'm willing to make more of a bet on that than the playing series. I mean, we agree on that one. Like, well, people will vote. Will have to vote with their wallets at the end of the day. Yeah, that's that's going to be what it comes to. The thing is, what I do have optimism for is if this does go like tragically right off the bat and things don't change, the NHL will have motivation because if if fans are voting with their wallet and they're not purchasing these products and they go to something, you know, a knockoff product or whatever it is, the NHL will be forced to change. They've tied their hands, I I think, with a 10-year deal. I don't know the the ins and outs of that business contract, what control the NHL has or could elicit the what the out clauses are, whatever it is. But if fans vote with their wallets, if if Fanatics isn't up to scuff, then that is how you you push for change, and that is when I actually have some confidence that things could change. Not because they wanted to, but because they are hurting the bottom line, and that's the only way fans can make an impact at this point. Anyhow, like I said, a happy topic. Let's get away from hockey for a second. The World Baseball Classic. Japan versus USA in the finals. The championship game. 
Shohei Otani, Mike Trout, two of the greatest players of all time, obviously two of the best players in the MLB right now, both play for the Angels. Top of the ninth, I accidentally tweeted bottom of the ninth. Top of the ninth, USA's one run down. Otani, who is this freak who is made in a lab, who can hit and pitch at an elite level, is warming up in the bullpen. You can see it coming. Otani versus Trout, head-to-head, to decide the game. Full count, 3-2 count. Otani's been chasing him. He's been going right after Trout and throws like the nastiest slider to make Mike Trout strike out. Japan wins a World Baseball Classic. It is one of the greatest, I am not exaggerating, I think one of the greatest moments in modern sports history because you can't have scripted it better. Two goats facing each other, representing their countries, playing on the same team in the MLB. Like At the top of the ninth to decide the game, that is, you cannot have asked for anything better and we were laughing before the podcast brad because what did hockey fans immediately do rather than just enjoy it started complaining that best, ho- I, best i can do is team north america yeah. <laughs> but i think six years ago i think hockey fans are right to complain because the mlb and baseball fans got that and think of how many fans internationally well it's huge look at the stadiums when puerto rico are playing um at- Literally any of the teams that aren't America. Everybody's there and they're having a party. It's crazy. It's We're jealous that we don't have that. And you know what? It has made, I guarantee you, more North Americans. We're talking about it yeah. on a hockey podcast. How many Canadians, how many people in the States who maybe weren't otherwise fans of baseball or would have watched are now interested? This demonstrates the value of international best-on-best competition for your sport, period. And the kicker is... The MLB controls this. The NHL can and have... And you would never... Re- I mean, I'm not a baseball person, but as a very outside observer of it, I kind of had no idea MLB was even involved, which I think for the NHL would be a good thing. <laughs> it is It is exactly the kind of model that the NHL should look at. Every four years, make sure your players go to the Olympics, which is the pinnacle of, you know... That is hockey international best on best. That is the gold standard, no pun intended. And until something changes, that's going to continue to be the gold standard in the minds of players both here and abroad. And then on your offsetting two years, have your World Cup. Have your World Cup of hockey. Run. Have the NHL run it. doesn't matter what you want. Don't do anything gimmicky. Don't do Team North America as fun as it was. I, I love that. But make it a true international best on best competition. How many years have we been robbed of McDavid versus Matthews. How many years have we been robbed of McDavid and Crosby playing together at any... There's a realistic chance that will never happen. That's... That we won't have Crosby, McDavid, and a team together. And those are... We're just talking about, you know, Canada and the States. How many storylines across every single major hockey nation are we not going to get now? I don't know. This has to be a big wake-up call, especially for a team or a sport, I should say, that trails other major professional sports, as we've been talking a lot about over the last few episodes... You want to be you want to get a bigger cut of the MLB's pie? Look what they're doing. They're it's more more games, right? Like it's more more eyes on it. It's it's more revenue. New Jersey's, we could talk about that again if we want. Um but I mean, I don't think we need to convince each other that this needs to happen. I think everyone is galvanized behind having a best on best tournament. It's what the fans want. Hmm. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Guess that's not happening. <laughs> Nothing brings the hockey world together like best on best hockey and f- shitting on fanatic. <laughs> the the hockey world has been more together now than they have been. It's great since before the first major lockout of this era. In one day, why the hell do we have this fanatics announcement in the morning and in the evening? Why the hell don't we have this? <laughs> Best the world on best sports tournament. The world has balanced itself out. Okay, so here's something. I, I want to ask you guys a genuine question because my bias has always been, and this is born of this is what I grew up with, so this is what I like, and this is what I think is right. But my bias has always been the Olympics are the gold standard, and sure. everything else is second, not second rate, but you know, second in line behind the Olympics. Is there a world where you can see – the same feeling that you have watching a, an intense gold medal game at the Olympics, but the, instead the NHL says no to the Olympics because of the insurance, the travel, whatever issues, and instead hosts an equivalent World Cup of hockey. 
would could you could that evoke the same feeling one to one in you where you wouldn't miss the Olympics? You just care about the tournament. Yes, but do I think the NHL has the s- skill to pull that off? No. You have to start somewhere. I- I'll. They did How, six years ago. Now, um, did you guys say they did seven since we started? What's momentum? Seven. Yeah. I'll agree with Evan in that I think the NHL, as they are run now, it's unlikely to happen. But yes, there's a world where that can happen, but my asterisk would be it will take time. Because something needs tradition, something needs frequency, something needs, you know, consistency to get the same thing that uh, the Olympics do. Because the Olympics have been every four years since you know god however many years it's been forever you know look how fondly people look back at the 70s and 80s canada cups some of the most legendary moments in hockey happened in those tournaments because they were essentially the world cup um they just called it the canada cup you know lemieux from gretzky you know daryl sittler's overtime winner against uh was it czechoslovakia at the time it can be done. Why? Because the Canada Cup happened all the time in the 70s and 80s. It was a regular occurrence. It was a true best on best tournament. It was, you know, the big bad Soviets and their powerhouse hockey team against Lemieux and Gretzky and, you know, that era of the NHL. They were all there. They were oh, all playing. Uh, very topical. We should do it now. So if the NHL, again, every four years, parades out a World Cup of hockey. Get the Russians against the States, against Canada, against Sweden, against Finland, and it's all their top players, and there's no weird, you know, team sum of Europe presented by fanatics. It's not complicated, but it has to be regular, it has to be consistent, and they have to have full buy-in from the NHLPA because all the big boys need to be there. Yeah, you kind of have to let it start and let let that event market itself. You know, you get people in the building, you get you get just something out there. And, you know, when it's your country, like, the players will care and they'll be the ones who end up marketing this event. And it, it'll only grow on its own organically like that. I mean, you look at the last two World Cups of hockey. As gimmicky and dumb as the last one was, we all remember that Team North America game versus Sweden because it was intense. It was entertaining. It was phenomenal hockey. Uh, the one before it, I, I know a lot of people listening to this might be a little too young to remember the 04 World Cup. That was a hell of a tournament. Everybody was into it. You know, the Le Cavalier's OT winner in the semifinals. It was a huge moment. Uh, gold medal, Shane Doan's winner against Finland, I think. I remember in my sphere of friends and, and coworkers, we were all fully invested in it. But that's two tournaments since the 90s. No wonder it has no traction. Again, consistency and best on best is all it needs. Literally all it needs. The And it will succeed. You both touched on a point that I think is going to be what's going to decide this. And you said the NHLPA. And not that the NHLPA has to have buy-in. You can see where the chips are being laid on the table right now. There's a CBA coming up. There's a new head of the NHLPA. Whether or not this is in the NHL's best interest, they know the players want this. And yes, pressure from your best players like Connor McDavid, that's pressure. But they're going to say, hey, Marty Walsh, your most important player in the NHLPA wants this. Negotiate for it. We'll give you the Olympics guaranteed every time. But we want this big thing in exchange. And it will be a big thing. Like the- Another five years of fanatics. Yeah, well, the NHL had did it anyways. And you know what? Let's not <laughs> let the PA off the hook here. If Fanatics is offering the most money, the players are the ones wearing the jerseys. They know it's going to be of sufficient quality on ice. They don't care who it is. No, no, they absolutely do not. No, and nor should they. I don't fault the NHL PA for that. Oh, this is going to help the salary cap go up? Great, sign us up. But the NHL is going to use this as a bargaining chip. And it's already been a conversation in past CBAs, and they're going to say, you want the Olympics negotiate for it i think it's an easier negotiation than the olympics though to say to, to get a world cup of hockey because yeah the nhl they would, would have own the it pie. they would ha- they would get the whole slice of the pie basically they just need to pay the players out however they would structure that the olympics for sure is the still the the, the tricky one to sort out 
even though you're not seeing the dollars into your account immediately, it's it's investing in new fans and what a way to do it other than you're not buying, you know, commercials. You're not buying whatever ad slots. Like this is the best demonstration of this game by sending these players to these international tournaments. You have to just see past the immediate returns of money and get it done. Now, the International Olympic Committee, about as uh, you know, reputable as FIFA is, that is to say, incredibly corrupt and also notoriously difficult to work with. There have been diff, uh, issues in terms of who insures or pays for these players' insurance because players go over there, get hurt, whatever, and then they're, this, these teams are effed for the playoffs. And why would owners want that, especially if they get – it's just going to hurt their checkbook? I understand that. I don't cry for billionaires, but I understand the business move. Between the NHL, NHLPA, and IOC, everyone has to make some concessions here for this to work consistently in the future. That's why it hasn't happened. But the NHL needs to see that the best solution here is to have the Olympics every four years and on the offsetting two-year cycle, the World Cup of Hockey, run something. Has to be small scale, smaller tournament, whatever. You have to have it in the same location for the first three times you run it, whatever. Figure it out. Because you're just investing in the game. You're creating new fans. It is, this sport loves to say, please love my sport, but they just don't know how to say it effectively. Like, oh, hockey fans are, as I was growing up, it was the joke was hockey fans have to argue with NASCAR fans because NASCAR is bigger in America than hockey. And now it's, oh, hockey fans have to argue with the MLS because MLS has vastly surpassed them in terms of, uh, you know, viewership and fan engagement and things like that. Like, you have to help yourself. Why do you think MLS engage or the, their interest in the MLS is so high right now? What just happened in the world of international soccer? Well, the world next World Cup is in North America. So time is of the essence because at some point it's going to be too deep of a hole to, to successfully dig yourself out of. Because what needs to happen here to simplify this is the Olympics brings in new hockey fans because of the reach that it has. The World Cup of Hockey keeps those new hockey fans because you're getting this regularly On every nice two years cadence, yeah. at the very least it's let's we just talk about the business side of it so much like the, it's incredibly sterile let's have some emotion for a second we deserve this as fans we deserve to see best on best it's not all From about an entertainment perspective. We want to see the best players represent their country and put it all on the line. Like how long has it been since we've had Canada and U S Face off. How long has it been since we've had you know, Finland and Sweden? Like, thank goodness for women's international hockey, because otherwise we'd have nothing on these fronts. There's a World Juniors. The world but it's, ju- it's, but that's not best on best. That's juniors. It's not. It's not. It scratches a little bit of the itch, but it doesn't give you the superstar winner take all type thing. The the last true best on best hockey tournament at the international level was 2014. Sochi Olympics. It's so sad. It's so incredibly sad. The the executives in the NHL would laugh if they heard me say this. But I think there's a responsibility for the NHL. If you want to be the premier NHL or hockey league in the world, which they are, you have a responsibility as a steward of the sport to do what is best for the sport. And this is where everyone in the room starts laughing and says, okay, put your put your wallet where your mouth is. Are you the one putting up you know, tens to hundreds of millions of dollars in operations each year. And that's fair. But as fans, they look to the NHL to be stewards of the sport and do what's best for the game. I understand they are business focused first, but those two things are the same. And it, you just hope that they can look at what happened last night in the World Baseball Classic and say, we need this. Oh, yeah, we need this. And we've actually screwed up by not doing this before. The best time to do this was, you know, 2018. The second best time is now. We'll see where the NHL goes with it. All right. Wow. Lots of rants this episode. Jeez. Uh, Some Red Wings news. Red Savage, friend of the podcast and Red Wings prospect, has uh, entered the transfer portal. He has left uh, the Miami Red Hawks and is actually transferring to Michigan State. Hmm. So he's going to be a Spartan next season. So uh, Red Savage comes a little bit closer to home uh, in terms of where the Red Wings are going to be able to view him. And... uh, Wish the best for him uh, playing for MSU next year. It'll be exciting to see him play in in that program. And uh, it's an advantage for the Red Wings having him basically in their backyard to as they watch his development go. 
Yeah, I wish nothing but success for Red Savage, and I want to see a lot of L's next to his team's name next year. <laughs> I want a lot of 4-3 losses with Red Savage hat-tricks. I'll say uh, against, you know, the Wolverines. Go blue, but Red Savage every other game. Hope you crush it. He got out of Ohio. That is a big upgrade. Uh, and then it has been reported by Kevin Weeks that the Red Wings have signed Livonian native and UMass Lowell captain John McDonald, who's a left-handed defenseman, uh, to a contract. Uh, details of that are still to be determined. Um, it appears that he just finished his senior campaign, uh, had 20 points in 35 games this season, and uh, we'll see whether he's expected to join Grand Rapids or Detroit or whatever it might be uh, as, the, as those details um, uh, get released. He's 24 years old, again, a Michigan native from Livonia, and I wonder if this has anything to do with either Johansson and or Edvinson being hurt. Or if this was just a college free agent that they've been targeting the whole time. College free agents, free asset, never a bad idea. Yeah. Should also be mentioned, actually, that um, McDonald could go to Toledo. So, uh, again, we'll see where he's eventually signed. For now, let's jump into overtime. Overtime is brought to you by our Patreon supporters. Uh, if you want to know how this show runs, it's because of our uh, patrons. So thank you so much to all of you who support the show. Patreon.com slash Winged Wheel Podcast if you want to join the Dub Dub Club. You get access to our uh, official Winged Wheel Podcast Discord, uh, which is a fantastic community. You also get access to our Patreon-exclusive overtime bonus episodes, which record right after the main episode. And we answer any questions that uh, aren't answered on the main show, have uh, a lot of good discussion, and just let loose. Uh, additionally, you're entered into all of our giveaways. Uh, we've given away two tickets to every Detroit Red Wings home game this season, the vast, vast majority of them going to patrons. So patreon.com slash Winged Wheel Podcast for all those benefits and more. A uh, question here from Apple Cider says, if Edvinson and Cider reach their maximum potential in five years, will the Wings have the best top line D pairing in hockey? No, but it will be up there. Ceiling potential? It depends who Kale McCarr is playing with at the time. Yeah, I guess. I don't know. It would. It, I would have to think it'd be up there. They'd be in the conversation. If they both reach their ceiling, however unlikely that is, yes, they would... Have to be, although, let's be honest, if they both reach their ceiling, they're probably playing on different pairs. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Babe Landiscock says, you guys often say during prospect profiles, he's a toolsy guy or all the tools in the toolbox. I don't completely understand what you mean by that in terms of a prospect. Can you expand a little? Uh, good skater, good shot, uh, good hands. Sometimes if we call someone toolsy, but they're not super highly ranked, it means maybe the hockey IQ isn't all there. Yeah. Um, generally, that's what it is. Like all the all the physical attributes that are required to make a good hockey player are there, and they just for whatever reason don't put it all together. And sometimes they do. Uh, recent examples: William Wallander was a toolsy pick, and he has since figured it out and looks like a good prospect. Philip Zadina is a toolsy player. He has not been able to figure it out. He's got a good shot, good hands, and can skate. Why isn't he scoring a million goals? You know, that was kind of what uh had a good shot. Had a good shot. He's still yep. really hard. Just he just can't aim it for shit, but it's there. <laughs> <laughs> it takes too long to get a shooting cadence reminds me of me, and let me tell you that was not a good thing. Yeah. But yeah, so tools it just means the the physical skills required to be a good hockey player are there. Yeah, I agree. It's and not- sometimes tools he can come with the hockey IQ, so I'm not saying when we say toolsy, it's, yeah. there's no hockey IQ. But I was going to say it's not completely independent of hockey IQ, but it's essentially, yeah, looking that. And if you want to say, well, then what does hockey IQ matter? Uh, someone who has really, 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 really hockey IQ can be a much better player than someone who is toolsier than him or has better physical attributes than him. Yeah, put it this way. I wouldn't call Patrice Bergeron a toolsy player. He's not a great skater, doesn't have a fantastic shot. And yet he's one of the best centers in the game. Why? Hockey IQ. We should all uh, aspire to age so well as Patrice Bergeron. The other day I was uh, bent over petting my dog and I leaned too much on one leg and I'm still feeling it today. So <laughs> not on the right path. Reed Matthews says, between Pittsburgh and Washington, who's going to be hurting the worst whenever their superstars retire? Oof. Oh, man. Probably. It's got to be Pittsburgh, right? I think so. They're neither one of them are exactly positioned to be 
they're, they're getting back to previous heights very quickly. Like five years from now, there could be a, a tank battle for the first overall pick between oh these two teams. History repeats itself. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah, I, I'll say Pittsburgh, and I think it's because they will have been losing more all at once. They have a lot of pressure from Crosby and Malkin and Latang to continue to make them competitive. Not, none of those guys are interested in going elsewhere. Malkin came close but didn't. Crosby doesn't want to retire anywhere else, but Crosby doesn't want to finish his career on a, you know, let's see how many points we can get in nurturing our young guys kind of way. And they frankly don't have the draft and prospect capital to even make that worthwhile. So there's a lot of pressure for them to mor- continue to mortgage futures to to build around them. Yeah, Washington just sold a little bit now, so they actually have a little bit in the way of future assets. Yeah, and a lot of Washington's key players, uh, Wilson Kuznetsov, you know, are not in their mid 30s. Like almost all of the Penguins' key players outside of Gensel, who might be going. So, can you imagine Washington gets Bedard? No, don't. <laughs> Uh, Beer League Defenseman says, if you had to pick one and only one, which would you pick for all of your gear, sticks, skates, etc.? CCM or Bauer? All of, I have my preferences brand relative to the piece of equipment, but if I had to go exclusively with one, I'm probably going with Bauer. The only thing I have that's not Bauer are, are my pants and helmet. I only have two pieces of gear that aren't Bauer, but they're really damn important pieces, which is what gives me pause. I'm entirely Bauer except for helmet and skates. Yeah, skates is probably the one. Skates and stick for me would be like the two deciding pieces. Not for all equipment, but how much is Easton missed in the hockey gear world? They're well, it's, not it's Bauer. In Bauer. <laughs> yeah, but like, you, did anything change with that line? Is what I'm asking. Like, the Bauer Vapor line is the Easton Stealth line. So you yeah. don't. They you literally took them. the Easton Stealth stick and yeah. took all the patents and turned it into the Vapor. It's funny because talking about this, it, it made me think of like the small pipe dream people had of CCM taking over the NHL jersey, and it's just like it seems so stupid in retrospect. Like, no, they were never going to do that. But that would have been that would have been a you know, it would have satisfied would the have old saved heads. us like 25 minutes <laughs> on this podcast. That's right. Uh, this question from my name is Ryan. I'm not a doctor, but I play one on a podcast. It says, uh, guys, of the RFAs and UFAs, who do you bring back next year? So, uh, Pew Suter, UFA, does he come back next year? Depending what he's asking, but I would like him to, yes. He's just wrapping up a $3.25 million cap hit. He's going to want more. Is he? I think so. He's going to want more. Is he going to get more? He may get more elsewhere. I don't think he will. I think 100 bucks? <laughs> <laughs> I think he's a center who, for other teams, who has done really well for himself, especially on the back half of the year, close to free agency. I think he's going to show really well to to. I to could be teams. dead wrong, but I don't think anybody outside of Detroit has noticed. I I disagree. I think this is the exact kind of thing. I think there's attention on him at the trade deadline, and I think teams will be looking for He plays a positional premium, or he can. If if he was this highly valued around the league as we think he should be, he would have been moved at the deadline. So what do you think? Do you think? I would like him to come back. I'm going to, my answers for this are all going to be not what I think, because God knows what their contract demands are. So I'm just going to say I would like him to be back. Okay. That's fair. Adam Ernie. No. Uh, Valeno, obviously. Yep. Alex Chason. Tentative, yes. Matt Luff is technically an RFA. No. I mean, for Grand Rapids depth, sure, I like the guy, but I don't think he should factor into Detroit next year, ideally. Jordan Osterley. I actually don't mind Jordan Osterley, but I just don't see where he fits next year. That's my that's my thing. Like Osterley uh, as a seventh guy, sure. Yeah, Lindstrom's an RFA. Hag is a UFA. For me, I say let Hag go. Uh, Lindstrom, I could care less if he stays or goes. It's, I mean, if Edvinson and Johansson come in and aren't ready, and I don't think that's likely for at least Edvinson. Uh, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be surprised if Johansson makes it very interesting too. Not to mention Willinder, like. There's going to be a lot of competition, so you don't want to jam it up with six, seven guys who are going to need roster spots because they're veterans. But uh, I don't know. I mean, you need the depth. It came in handy this year. Like, yeah. 
Magnus Helberg, that's an interesting one. I would hope we upgrade. <laughs> I agree. I I like Magnus. Seems like a nice guy. Who knows? If he plays lights out the rest of the season, I can see an argument to bring him in, but I would want at least some competition for him. I would like an upgrade, but I like him enough that if he's our backup next year, I'm I'm not devastated. Uh, Nedeljkovic, very obviously his future is not with the team. Uh, Mark Pesic, very <laughs> hard to say. TBD? Yeah, I don't know. He shoots right. He so. shoots right, so that might be the saving grace. You don't know how his recovery has gone. Lump him in the conversation with Hag and Osterley, I guess. I don't know. I, you got to feel bad for that guy, though, especially. Okay. Uh, thank you all for putting up with a very ranty episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast. We're going to be back with you on Sunday, uh, two games between now and then. Again, DetroitRedWings.com slash WWP if you want to get your tickets to Winged Wheel Podcast Day at the LCA on Saturday, April 8th. Uh, if tickets have run out and you want to find another way to support the Jamie Daniels Foundation and or if you like to laugh, JamieDanielsFoundation.org for a comedy night of hope. Plenty more to come. Uh, Patreon.com slash Winged Wheel Podcast to support the show uh, if you're a listener, new or old, thank you so much for tuning in. And for all of our patrons, we can't say thank you enough. Uh, our name level sponsors, Arjun Shanker, Eves Bartels on behalf of the Sierra Grand Foundation, Akefer, Bertuzzi is straight up missing, Nick Perks, Icon, uh, We Are Geelong, the greatest team of all, uh, Glenn Brabham, Aiden White, Jordan Bernaski, Keenan O'Donohue, Yanni Burgers, Meals on Wheels, Matthew M. Rice, Croner's Left Knee, Babe Landeskog, Burt Baconator, Carl Brutanen and Aluski, Chimmy, Chris P, Citizen High Five, Connor Scovey, Coyote Season Tickets in Tempe, Denny's Gamer Girl, Derek Enstam, Detroit Rob, DJ Denton. Do any players listen to this? <clears throat> Give Blood Fight Probert, Hassam Al Kassem, Jay Gollum, Jacob Turner, Joel Miranda, Joseph Barry, Kalen Wood, Kevin James, King Tone, Las Ensaladas Picantes, Marcus, Massive Wong, Evan Longsaber. Matt McKay, Michael Edland, Nicholas Fritz, Oliver, close off, RA, uh, Red T, Red 3, Scott Martin, send it Seawolf, that's what I appreciate about you, Wallman's Elite Dancing D, General Andy Bohan of the Cheesebag Army, Sam Bankson, Number 1 Rob, the Big Hog Hag and the Detroit Red Guys fan, A.A. Ron, Adam Gowitska, Adam Rose, Antonio Gracias, Brad Simmons, Brian Vasha, CJ Wilkinson, Connor Leighton, Corey Prita, Darren Fick, Flo T Cast, Forever and Always, Bertuzzi's, Bertuzzi's Lost Tooth, Frank Stanley, George's Biggest Fan, Grand Rapids Hockey Guy, Griffey Boy, Instructions Unclear, Cheese Bag No Longer Fresh, Jam- James Laporte, Jeremiah Dobo, J- JM Rhapsody, John Evans, John Ingalls, Josh Yelton, Kevin McCracken, Quaz, Lieutenant Matt S of the Cheese Bag Army, Linda Hull, Matt Keeler, Maximilian, Melissa Erickson, Norris Sider, noted Philip Zadina Whisperer, Ben Barron, O. Ophelia, Reed, Stephen, Tatar Sauce, The Hodag, and Ian Grant. Thank you all so very much. We'll talk to you Sunday. Thanks for tuning in to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Be sure to check out wingedwheelpodcast.com, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll also find links to other ways to support the show, such as Patreon, official podcast apparel, and more. And don't forget to follow the show on Twitter at Winged Wheel Pod. And of course, the hosts at Brad Crisco, at Ryan Hanna WWP, and at Hockey Town Evan.